Have you been to the border? Because I have. I'm here right now. And let me tell you something, America. You got a problem. And it's bull****. Eagle Pass. You probably heard of it. Shelby Park. It's crazy. All sorts of crazy stuff going on here. A thousand migrants a day crossing the border. How crazy is that Pretty crazy. But let's talk about it because it's a lot more than you might think. And I'm not talking about the migrants. Tackett and myself took a journey down to the Texas-Mexico border to see with our own eyes if the illusion is really what it is. But where did we go and why did we go there? As an American citizen, it is super important that you find out the truth for yourself, to be informed about what's going on inside the news cycle. We have been shown repeatedly in recent years that the media and politicians have a corrupted incentive structure to not always tell you the truth and to paint things in very disillusioned ways. And what we found out while we were there, when people say things like, There's a standoff between federal and Texas authorities over border control. Texas is America's Alamo. We have to hold the line right here. There are signs the Biden administration may be backing down from a standoff between the state of Texas and the feds at the southern border. The Texas National Guard is blocking federal agents from patrolling this section of the U.S.-Mexico border. Top Texas officials say they will not comply with is that really the truth so what is the narrative that's being pushed to the american people is it only being thrown around to drive political campaign donations or is there actually a threat to national security is there a threat to the border is there a threat to you and your family at home because there are a lot of politicians and media sources that are saying that there is now when we got down there actually got our own boots on the ground and eyes in the sky the situation seems a little bit different <laughs> I think one of the most glaring, obvious, most egregious things that we've discovered almost immediately having lunch with a National Guard company commander and his first sergeant was that there is no standoff between federal, state, or local authorities at all. In fact, the federal authorities that are there are extremely happy to have the assistance of the National Guard and the National Guard has been stationed, that specific company commander has been there for three years. None of this is new. When the narrative is being pushed to us that this is a guns out situation between federal and state. That it's being pushed that Border Patrol is actively trying to fight back against National Guard. It's spun in a way that we could be facing civil war on our doorstep. It's being spun as a Fort Sumter moment, a powder keg ready to kick off a civil war inside the United States. Unfortunately, the conversations that we had had to be off the record because these people will lose their jobs. Most of the authorities there are not only under a NDA or a gag order because of their job, but within the last couple of years, those gag orders have been revised, re-signed, and incredibly strengthened. For those people to go on record in any way would be a immediate termination of their jobs, as well as potentially criminally liable. So how can you believe us when we tell you these things? Well, you can't. Besides for the fact that we have zero political affiliation, we don't care and all we want is the truth. I have no purpose, reason, or incentive to tell you anything false. The biggest question is just simply, is the system broken? And if so, is anyone trying to fix it? If the Biden administration is saying that Abbott doesn't have the authority to do this and he's going against the Constitution. But because the Biden administration believes those very actions are unconstitutional. Then why is it that the U.S. government itself recognizes that Section 8 U.S.C. 1325 that defines illegal and improper entry by alien as a crime? So if that's a crime and the state governor is indeed quote unquote enforcing that, how is it that the Biden administration has any leg to say that they're doing something illegal? Right on top of that, out of the gate, it's obvious that the Biden administration and federal authorities do believe it's a crime because every migrant that comes across the border is given a court date to return for having broken the federal law. If you're trying to leave Cuba, Nicaragua, or Haiti, you have and we or have agreed to begin a journey to America, do not do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. Starting today, if you don't apply through the legal process, you will not be eligible for this new parole program. One must have a lawful sponsor here in the United States who agrees to sponsor you to get here. Then that person has to go undergo rigorous background checks and apply from outside the United States and not cross the border illegally in the meantime. If they apply and their application is approved, they can use the same app, the CBP-1 app, 
to present at a port of entry and be able to work in the United States legally for two years. That's the process. But if their application is denied, or if they attempt to cross into the United States unlawfully, they'll be returned back to Mexico and will not be eligible for this program after that. So if federal agents are indeed giving them court dates by breaking the law, then what seems to be the problem? What is the hubbub and why is it such an event of enormous proportions? If both sides of the authorities, state, local, and federal, all agree that there are laws being broken, what is the standoff between those authorities and why is it being spun through politicians or the media that they aren't working cohesively together? Who and what is the incentive structure to say that there is a conflict? So when Tackett and I were down in Shelby Park, one of the first things that we noticed is it's a very small area of operation. The photo op that you see is exactly that. Have you ever stuck your hand in a running faucet? That's Shelby Park. The water are the immigrants. When you see reports on the national news or from politicians that state with the addition of National Guard troops in Shelby Park that the immigration crisis has been slowed or stopped to 95 to 99 percent of crossings, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people crossing a day to 30 people a week, they are referring to a couple of hundred meter long stretch of connexes and sea wire. The actual crossings haven't slowed down. So when we were speaking to these National Guardsmen, we found out something rather, I would classify it as horrifying. As a prior service member, the most egregious information that I received while we were there was to find out that the National Guard that has been stood up and activated by the governor receives no federal funding, as I would have expected, and no federal VA health benefits, as I would have expected. But they are also receiving no state level health insurance benefits. If you get hurt or die while while you are activated by the state, you have to pay out of pocket for those medical bills. The lowest level National Guard member down there is paying out of pocket for a health insurance program while being deployed for years on end and living out of a tent. We asked them how morale was and their simple response was a head shake and shitty. So what is the purpose of you guys being there if it's doing essentially quote unquote nothing and it's stopping migrants coming through Shelby Park, that's for sure. So they're not doing nothing. To which this National Guardsman looked at me and said, we have armored vehicles with no mounted weapons. Do with that information what you want. If there was an actual standoff like it's being billed through the national media, there's a standoff. From a standoff. Then why were there no fighting positions being built? Why were there no standoffs between federal and local authorities? And why did both sides of that coin or the guys on ground doing the job repeatedly state that they were so happy to have assistance from all sides, begging the question, where is the conflict actually coming from? So the day Governor Abbott and the other governors who came in support, and we're here together to collaboratively work to support Texas, of Texas were arriving, we decided to do something maybe a little risky. <laughs> We said, hey, what if we go to Mexico? With no passports. With no passports. That's so dumb. You are really dumb, for real. We met an independent journalist down by the gate of Shelby Park, who we ended up talking to. We met Yoan Grillo, who has pretty much dedicated his life at this point to investigating the cartels. This man knows more about what's going on in Mexico than probably most of us do here at home, and probably most of them do in the Pentagon. I'm just saying. Since the governor's speeches were a press event only where you had to get a RSVP and you were on the governor's news list, we decided to hop the border with Yoan to get a better vantage point and view to see kind of what's going on. From just across the border, it was glaringly obvious that what we're looking at is nothing more than a photo op and lip service. For those of you who might be looking at this going, ah, the Democrats just want all these people in and the Republicans or the GOP are they're really fighting the border. I've got some bad news for you. They're not. If we all have some level of understanding that Border Patrol and CBP are being understaffed and overwhelmed, now we know that state and local authorities are not just being overwhelmed and understaffed, but even their health insurance benefits are being covered for. Members of the National Guard that are drowning in the river, attempting to save and help migrants that are crossing, their families receive nothing. That is a family with a loss of income and a loss of a family member, they'll just get absolutely nothing. Who is providing the actual assistance if they're not even providing assistance to the guys trying to make a difference on ground? Is there an actual willingness to stop the problem? They make it look a lot more grandiose than it really is. It's a small group of people that just crowded around this, I would call a very small line across the border. Within the same hour of all of the governors being there, we decided, hey, it's time to get back. 
We have a flight to make, and we're not sure how long Border Patrol is gonna take for us to get back. Now, mind you, the governors are still right across the Rio Grande from us. We made it to the Border Patrol office in about two minutes of walking across the bridge without passports getting back into the country while 14 governors are standing no more than 500 meters away from us. It took both Tacken and I no more than 30 seconds to get across the border. With absolutely no questions asked in any way. And that's not a mark on the border patrol agents. It's just a glaring reminder of how broken this system is. There's no control to the point that all it took for us to cross was an American driver's license and the outward persona that we were in fact Americans. That we were supposed to be there. This was part of the conversation that I had with Border Patrol agent myself. He asked, why the fuck did you go to Mexico <laughs> right now? You know, we had a little conversation and as I explained to him that I'm trying to figure out what is really going on, he decided to share his mind with me. This Border Patrol agent looked at me and said, this is all a fucking joke. The governor down there is gonna do nothing. The administration before him has done nothing. The administration after him will do nothing. He said, the White House, the governor, they're doing nothing. I wish they would just get out of our way and allow us and the National Guard to handle the situation. It's making it more difficult for us and it's all a dog and pony show. They're pissed off. Which highlights the fact that the conflict is not on a ground level with local, state, and federal authorities, with Border Patrol members, with National Guard members. But in fact, the only conflict happening is from opposing political opinions, driving campaign donations to their political parties. Both sides of the political coin profiting on the back of the humanitarian crisis happening on the border while both political parties create an environment that makes the situation worse, not only for the migrants, but also for the state, local, and federal authorities that are stuck trying to make a difference. Once again, we discover that the man on ground is being abused and misused by the powers that be. After the ease of crossing the border ourselves, we received some information, and this was a glaring, glaring problem at what we're facing. Because, again, after what we saw at Shelby Park, it's this very small area. The question is, where then is it diverted to? Because of the audience base that I've built with my platform, Mad Minute Tacticians, most of the guys that follow me are professional authorities of some way. Cops, firefighters, federal law enforcement, military members. Having those resources of those guys being able to reach out and give us the true on the ground story, even in an unnamed way, paid dividends. On the same day that Governor Abbott held his press conference, 10 miles upstream, thousands of people crossed the border. We have documented photographs that we'll put up on screen of all of the remnants left over of them changing out of their wet clothing into dry clothing and just leaving the wet clothing there. What we also found out was not only did at least a thousand people cross the border that day, but three people drowned at the same time. The reason I brought up Yoen earlier, this man understands the cartels. He understands the Mexican military. He knows what is dangerous. He knows what is normal. He knows what is abnormal. He went up at about 10 miles up the river. These are his words himself. He went up about 10 miles up the river, ran into some military types. At first, he wasn't so sure what was going on, but then things started to get abnormal to him. He said, it was a strange situation. They were asking for his name, his identification. They were started asking for his phone and making him throw things on the ground. To him, he thought he was going to get kidnapped. Now, again, this is a man that lives in Mexico and deals with the cartel on a regular basis. And this was a scary, frightening, and abnormal situation for him based on how he has experienced military personnel. In his own words, he said, it seems like they might be guarding something or guarding someone up in a house that was close by, only to be further substantiated by the messages we received from the active members down there in Texas. For me, having military and tactical experience, if you have a distraction, like all of the governors, the drain of resources that that is gonna have, establishing security around that, if you could run another distraction 10 miles upstream of a thousand person crossing is another drain of resources. It allows massive, huge, wide open border, basically everywhere else, everywhere near there. So what else and who else crossed the border that day? From Azerbaijan, and he'd been in jail for the last 12 years on terrorism charges. Take a look at this. Yes, by the way, if you are smart enough, you will know who I am. But you are really not smart enough to know who I am. 
but soon you're gonna know who I am. Now with what is being fed to us, with what we saw on the ground, the real question is what is the incentive? What is the purpose? Now, while some of this is theory, some of this is conjecture, other parts of this are kind of laid in stone. We are using Occam's razor. We are trying to use as little assumption as possible when we are coming to these conclusions. Obviously, unless it is written and documented, we can never say for certain. But we have to use what we saw and what we have gathered from the people that we spoke to, both on the federal and the state side, to figure out why the fuck this has happened. After 20 years of a global conflict and the misuse and abuse of American foreign policy, develops weapons of mass destruction. A new report has revealed that a U.S. drone strike that killed at least a dozen people in Yemen in December failed to comply with rules imposed by President Obama last year to protect civilians. Something that the average American just genuinely seems to gloss over and not appreciate is the level of threat that we face as a country. When Afghanistan fell apart, prisons were emptied around the Middle East as well as Guantanamo Bay. Some of the hardest criminals ever to exist on planet Earth with some of the biggest financial backings ever to exist on planet Earth are free. And angry. But soon you're gonna know who I am. With the known influence of Chinese government programs in cartel land, a lot of that being a part of the fentanyl trade, we know that our greatest adversaries, financially and spiritually, have an incentive to come here and cause harm. Why are we leaving the border so desperately wide open with such real national security threats? There, this is a crisis that is being painted as one of immigration, of racial profiling, of federal and state disagreements. The actual crisis ISIS is the national security threat. You'll hear the rhetoric from both sides of the aisle, whether it's Democrat, Republican, or anywhere in between, as well as from news or even citizens who might not have looked into it well enough. You'll hear that we have a immigration problem and these people are coming in and they are invading. Now, the problem really isn't immigrants per se. We'll get to that in a second. They're mostly used as currency, and that's where it starts to get really, really dark. The migrant process of crossing is a forced process by the cartels. After speaking with Yoan, one of the most interesting parts that we learned from having a conversation with him was that the migrants aren't given an option. The convoys, a great question that most people have is, how are these convoys getting put together? How are a thousand people a day being organized to cross the border? And the simple answer is the cartels are organizing them and then forcing them across the border, regardless of their ability to cross the river, regardless of their ability to survive the crossing at all. The cartels are using the migrants as a distractionary force, but they are also using them as indentured servitude. Even if you came to the border with the financial ability to cross in a legal manner, because of the cartel's ownership of the border, they're going to take everything that you have from you to include maybe your children to put into the sex trade and drive you across the border as a distraction. It just keeps coming full circle to who and what else is coming across the border. Who is financing the migrant convoys to cross the border? One of the questions that I posed to Yoan, since he is a wealth of knowledge and information on the cartels, I asked him, why are all these people leaving? Why, are, why do you think they are being driven out or their incentive to come over to the United States? Is it really that much better over here for them? To which he answered, the cartel is disrupting, disabling, and destroying these people's lives, homes, their locales, and they are creating the problem themselves. Now that leads into another question of where that happens, but we'll get to that in a second. If the cartel is then creating the problem and the way for these migrants to get across the border is the cartels, they're creating a problem to solve the problem themselves. It's an infinite money loop, if you will. The way I look at it as an American, I like to think the cartels can't have that much power. They can't have that much control over the American border. So what's the incentive on the American side? And it immediately brings into question the American political elites. If we listen to the GOP politicians and conservative media, it's very easy to believe the lie that the Democratic Party, specifically the Biden administration, are encouraging, if not outright paying for and organizing the migrant crossings to generate a voter base, to artificially boost population numbers to keep electoral college votes. But that again begs the question, why is the GOP unable to stop it? And is there an incentive program for GOP politicians? And obviously after being at Eagle Pass and seeing that so much of the border crossing, the reinforcement of the border crossing and the policies with how the troops and federal authorities are being used and again abused by the system, it just seems too obvious to me that the GOP structure, if they fixed the problem, would have nothing to run on. They would have nothing to campaign 
campaign on to drive campaign do donations. It's such an easy thing for them to look and point at the Democratic side of the aisle and blame them for the problem. It's an excellent platform to run on, to maintain power, to maintain control, and to drive campaign donations. Is there actually an incentive on the conservative side of the aisle to stop the problem? And when you see it in person and see that it, I mean, it just doesn't look like they're actually trying. It looks like they are actively tying the hands of the guys on ground to prevent them from stopping the problem, which is what every single level of professional authority that we talked to said. Every single National Guard, state and local authority said, if the politicians got out of the way, we could stop this. You're being lied to. I'm being lied to. I don't care if you're lied to, but me being lied to, I don't like that shit. And I'm sure you don't either. What becomes abundantly clear through this whole situation is both left wing and right wing are both wings of the same bird. They're both using the situation to try and benefit themselves. Migrants coming across typically, and according to statistics, are going to vote Democrat at least for their first year. You would say, why would they do that if it's only gonna be one year? Because those who want power will stay in power at any cost. Now, then when you look at the other wing, and you say, well, if there's a problem, they can push on, hey, we need to stop the problem. We need to band together. We need to be this group who will stop the Democrats who won't let these migrants come in. But as soon as you stop the problem, where's your funding? Where, what's the purpose for you to be in over the other people, if that's what you're running on? And if you believe that millions and millions of dollars of campaign donations isn't enough to corrupt someone's morality, you're wrong. So the question is, is the government working with the cartel? Yes. It has been proven time and time again through many different administrations that the government has business with the cartel and they will continue to do business with the cartel. From taking out competitors to the Sinaloan cartel, opening up borders so drugs can get across, to Operation Fast and Furious, of the ATF giving cartel illegal machine guns for then a federal agent to be killed in the crossfire. To the entire Iran-Contra conspiracy theory involving one of the most conservative, well-known leaders ever to exist in American history, President Ronald Reagan himself, and Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. They were caught red-handed repeatedly running one of the biggest drug and gun smuggling operations globally ever. So the question of whether or not the federal government or politicians would work hand in glove with terrorist organizations, with cartel organizations, it's been proven time and time again that we will absolutely do that. Some people might wrap some of these up as conspiracy theories, even though they're declassified documents. I wanna to read to you directly from John Ehrlichman, Nixon's aide about the war on drugs and how they knew and they were purposefully doing something horrendous and horrible against the American people. Do you wanna know what this was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That is directly from someone working in the federal government. So who does the federal government actually consider a threat? The cartels, terrorist organizations, the migrants, or you? Another question that is screaming in my head is why are the cartels not a terrorist organization in the federal government's eyes? In spite of the fact that more Americans have died overdosing on heroin, cocaine, and now fentanyl, than basically any other conflict in American history, how is it that the organizations that profit provide, build entire structures off of those things, aren't considered a terrorist organization. They're killing more Americans than any other threat on planet Earth, and yet they're allowed to operate with basically open impunity. They only have to deal with issues crossing the border, issues within the continental United States, but not issues at home. Why do we consider terrorists living in caves in Afghanistan as the greatest threat to the American public, but not Chinese fentanyl labs pumping illicit drugs across the border, killing thousands of Americans every month. It makes you wonder if there's an incentive structure there. If someone's receiving money, which has been shown time and time again to be the federal government. Now, it's not just the federal government that would be depressing and bleak. It's also the UN. The UN is funding migrants from all over the world and giving them money. But the question is, are the migrants receiving the money or somebody else? The UN is actively funding people to come to the United States, millions of people from all over the world, but soon you're gonna know who I am. to flood the United States. 
They said that they are going to give out some 370 odd million dollars to 600,000 migrants in the forms of rechargeable credit cards and cash in envelope. That means untrackable. Sure, maybe you could track the credit card, but let's be honest, it's gonna be cash overall. And where is that cash going? Who is that going to? Because I doubt the UN is walking people across the border, but who is? And I think we just answered that question. How many times have we heard the argument from the federal government that trickle-down economics is the way to solve the problem? Meaning your taxpayer dollars have to be taken, pulled away from you, out of your pocket, and given to the highest levels of power and structure within the United States to then be redisseminated back to you. Doesn't make sense, does it? Now, even though this has seemed very doom and gloom, and probably is, what the fuck's the solution? Personal responsibility starts with you. It ends with you. If you work in one of these organizations at any level of authority, you need to start screaming up the chain. The way that these things work is that you don't bitch down, you bitch up. If you are afraid to tell the person above you that what is happening is wrong, broken, and damaged, it's a humanitarian crisis. You have a responsibility to morality. You have a responsibility to other humans on planet Earth to start yelling at your superiors that this has to get fixed. And I'm not talking to the guys on ground. I am talking to the directors in offices. I am talking to the establishment within Washington, D.C., to the establishment within state and local authority levels. It starts with you. You have to sound the alarm. You have to be the person that's willing to lose their job in the effort of doing what is right for humanity. It's not even a question about what's right for the American public, but a question about what's right for humanity. There are people dying on a daily basis is not only from the drugs that are coming across the border, but from just trying to cross the border. Most of the people that are being driven across the border don't have a choice. Once they get there, they are put into a caravan and driven at gunpoint across the water, whether they can make it or not. It's the accountability that the American people has to hold the news, our government, our state and local officials. We cannot roll over. We cannot play dead and let these people just continuously lie to us. We need more people willing to go out and see what we saw and say, no, this is incorrect, this is wrong, you are lying and you need to be held accountable. We need to put these people who are willing to lie to our face out of office or in jail. Democracy dies in darkness, so be the light. It might seem difficult, it might seem hard, but it's not. It is simply in taking the information that you see, disseminating it down, and making a rational decision. If you watch Fox News every night, I challenge you to watch CNN every other night. See what they are saying. Disseminate the information because they are lying to you. Both sides are going to lie to you to try and make their point seem better. Go see it with your own eyes. Social media has been billed recently in our lifetime as a way to control information of the public, as a wing of the intelligence agencies, as a, as a, as a way to, to manipulate the public's perception of things. But there's always been a manipulation and control of the media, of the press, of information. There was once a time when only the priests within the Catholic Church could read the Bible. There was once a time when only certain people owned a printing press. The greatest thing to happen in mankind is the invention of social media and cell phones. You yourself can travel to the border and generate content just like this, and a million people screaming about it, a hundred million people screaming about it, becomes irrefutable proof of the humanitarian crisis. It also shows the politicians the average person's belief system and all politicians genuinely care about is maintaining money and power. If they believe that their money and power will be taken away because we are all yelling that this isn't the way to handle the problem, it'll get fixed overnight because the incentive structure will change. And again, I want to urge you that the problem is not Democrat or Republican. It's the same bird. We want our country to be built up. We want the world to be built up. We want humanity to be better. If you feel like Democrats are the problem, maybe go talk to them. Have a conversation with them and find common ground and vice versa. The point is not to diversify the United States anymore. It's not to split because together we stand and divided we fall and we are a divided country right now. We need to come together and find a solution that will help build America and build the world to what it needs to be. Before the next time that the media says there's a standoff between federal and state authorities and they're not lying and there is a civil war coming. Don't just expect more content covering these kind of crises from us here, but demand more from yourself. Demand more from your politicians. Demand more from your media. Demand more from your countrymen. We individually have to be the solution to these problems or we're going to lose control of what we hold dear. It's no longer somebody else's problem. It's all of our problem and we can solve it. It's a solvable problem, but we have to come together to do it. Thanks for watching. Thanks.